So the panel that we have today is to talk about uh, ad sales strategies. So if you go back in time six years, seven years, what people were talking about at, uh, at the RAIN convention, I wasn't there, but uh, what they were talking about is, was really, should we invest in, uh, in streaming? Should we have a digital strategy? Should we do something specifically for online audio, online radio? When that, when that question got answered, then people started looking at, OK, what, how to grow the audience? How to focus on players? What kind of streaming, et cetera, et cetera? When that got answered, then people started to look at monetization. Should it be subscription-based? Should it be ad-supported-based, et cetera? When that question got answered, then that's when we come to ad sales strategies. Is it direct sales? Is it more effective to go to network and representation? Is it better to, uh, to focus on exchange and programmatic? How do all those strategies fit together? What, are, what is the impact on CPMs, et cetera? So today, to try to answer some of those questions, we have a, a pretty interesting panel. So first of all, we have uh, Rob. So Rob is the CEO of Audio Boom. Um, then we have Stuart. Stuart is in charge of the commercial strategy at Global. We have uh, Benjamin, uh, who is the uh, SVP of uh, advertising products at Triton. And then uh, we have Alexander, CEO of uh, Radio Enemy and Target Spot. Um, so, uh, Stuart, maybe let's start with you. Uh, so, you recently launched uh, DAX, the uh, digital audio exchange uh, in the UK. So, you've been ramping up direct sales uh, to do so. You've been going out and being very vocal in the market. So, based on your experience so far, where, where do you think the budgets are coming from from an advertising point of view? I mean, I often get the question is it more radio agencies started to cover some of their radio budgets to go for? online radio, or is it more digital agencies interested in buying digital audio as, a, as an extension to digital? Um, I think the reality is kind of all of it. Um, the, what we were very keen to do to begin with was not sort of uh, focus it on radio money, because being blunt, we're a radio company and that would be crazy. Um, the, the idea that creating the uh, um, and embracing digital audio market properly because we felt there was a new marketplace for us, a new springboard for a new company, a new revenue stream that built on what we currently have. So um, we spoke to, within agencies, obviously the, uh, uh, the radio teams, the broadcast teams, the digital teams, and increasingly uh, larger populated mo mobile teams and agencies, and clients as well. And I think um, well, Scott here and Steve earlier mentioned the fact that the planners were quite crucial to it, because they hold the budgets. So we really focused on planners uh, and also clients to kind of work out what role it played. And that's been the focus of our attention so far. So I think to kind of, agencies aren't set up for every single innovation that comes up from media. And I think uh, for us, it was about covering all bases. I think we did, uh, some of the guys are there looking quite knackered. They did about 250 meetings in a, in a couple of months period. But that's what it was about, getting our story straight, building a market and for us, it was about creating a new market, not talking about radio budgets or anything like that. It was about a new purpose, a new opportunity, uh, and that's where we started it from. So, so talking about that, what were the, the key obstacles for you to, to ramp it up, to, to get it off the ground? Uh, to start it, oh, God, there are, there are hundreds. Um, the, I think working out how we positioned it in a market was, was quite interesting, uh, and how... We actually both have a different approach for all different audiences. Clients, it was a different thing. Planners, it was about why they would want to uh, divert money from, let's say, t TV or press or magazines or, uh, other, or even digital mobile into this particular platform. And to do that, we needed to work out what role it played in the comms mix. So there was a presentation designed around generating that and creating interest, if you like, and a bit of buzz around it. Uh, to investment directors, it was about what it did and uh, some of the, the discussions around monies and, and CPMs and, and the like. Uh, clients, it was about trying to get an interest around it all. So it was very much a horses for courses approach. Um, and I, d I don't regret any of that. It, it, it was torturous at the time, um, lots of horrifically late nights and, uh, and weekends. But I think we got it about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're, we're, every day, every, t every time the guys come back from meeting, we kind of have a little regroup and work out what, what are we getting wrong and what can we do to improve it. Uh, and that's the thing with I think probably most digital products nowadays. It's about just evolving it and having an agile approach to, to it all, really, because you're not going to get it right first off. And actually, really, I went to the States last year and met a lot of companies, including some of the companies that are surrounded here. And one thing we all learned really clearly was 
don't launch the perfect product because you're never going to get there. So we launched the product that we thought was, was good and strong and robust. And then we built it and enhanced it and developed it from that point onwards, reflecting the needs of agencies and clients um, and others for that matter, creative agencies, for example. So, so, Alexandre, uh, you obviously see the other side of the coin in a way because, when Stuart, you, you're going direct, you're, you're presenting uh, your inventory plus the inventory of others, but you're also representing yours. Alexandre, you, you lead TargetSpot, uh, who's a network in the US, a network in France. So how do you see it playing for you in terms of uh, the mix between digital and, and radio? So and, and do you see differences between ge geographies? Yeah, so, so you, you cannot compare uh, the US and Europe regarding the revenue for the moment. I think there is a lot of audience today, in digital audience in Europe, also a lot of digital audience in the US, but the market regarding the revenue in, in, in the US is, is really growing every, every year. I think that this year it will be around 10% of the, the investment that we have in, 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 in radio. And in Europe, is it in France, is it in Germany, is it in Spain? And, and I think also it's the same in UK. I would say it's perhaps one or two percent. So uh, if I compare, in, in the US for the moment, we are in the upfront period. So advertiser, uh, they, they buy ads for next year. And this year, uh, we have 40% more RFPs than last year. And so uh, I think that the problem this year already in the US is to, to have enough audience, enough inventory. We have uh, already this kind of problem in the US. It's not the same in, in Europe. And I, I would say it's also thanks to Pandora, because they did a, a great job uh, five years ago. They started five years ago to try to evangelize the, the market. And for the moment in Europe, we are more in, in this process. But I'm really confident about, uh, about the market also in, in Europe, because uh, all the new digital ad models arrives usually from the other side of the ocean. So uh, I would say that next year and the two next year are really important for, for the digital radio market in Europe. So I'd love to bounce back on your, on your comment about Pandora. I, I agree that Pandora, I think, has done a tremendous job educating the industry. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when you're going to, and, and this is maybe a, a question for, uh, for you, Rob, uh, you recently did a partnership with TalkSport to create a kind of vertical around, um, around sports. Do you think that when agencies look at digital radio, they're more interested in audience or content? And, and we keep hearing both. Are they, are they buying a brand, or are they buying actually the audience and, and the ability to target and be very specific about people? I think it's a really good question. I think it depends largely on the, the first part of this conversation. You know, is it, are you going to the digital buyers or are you going to the radio buyers? Because they're looking for different people. So the radio, it, it's about, you know, the, kind of the, the broad reach, and, and obviously the digital is more about the audience without any doubt at all. Um, I, I think maybe where, where we've approached it slightly differently is because we haven't come, if you like, with the, if you like, the, the, the business, obviously, that Stuart has is, is, is radio-focused. There's a lot of revenue coming in there. Why cannibalize that? <clears throat> Therefore, looking at different ways to, to go in and pitch what you're creating. We very much uh, approach the business from, uh, if you like, potentially more of a Spotify type model. So it's about the, the creation and curation of content that's specifically designed, built, and delivered for a digital audience. So it's shorter form, it's shorter form wrapped into to more packages, but maybe gives you the opportunity for more native advertising to go in there as well. Um, but, but in terms of, of generally where we're looking, it's going, it's around content right now. But we are absolutely focused on audience moving forward because, again, being 100% digitally focused, we can uh, dissect everything that we're doing down to, even down to handset, zip code, postcode. There is, there is no broadcast of what we're doing. It's very specifically designed to hit individual users at the point of delivery in an interactive media. So. Yeah, again, DAB radio and all of that kind of stuff. Mobile's already surpassed that. It's already being delivered straight to the handset. You know who you're delivering to. Ultimately, I see agencies will want to buy totally on, on targeted audience um, because we've got empirical data. And broadcast just doesn't, basically, unless you believe the radio figures. So, so, so why do you think that today we still have quite a few agencies saying, oh, 
we, we need a brand, or we, we need a couple of brands, at least part of the package. What, what do you think is the driver for uh, the driver the for that? Brand? Truth be told, I mean, yeah, good God, long enough in the digital industry, nearly 20 years at this point, and you know, saw what digital did to print, what it's done to, to TV in certain sectors as well, and what it will do to radio, you know, without, without any doubt at all. Um, so I, I, the driver is definitely going to be around, you know, de delivering to the point of, of uh, consumption, without any doubt. Okay. Yeah, sure. Fun enough from what Rob was saying. I think the, uh, something that Steve picked up on earlier, I think something doesn't have to die for something else to, to sort of build on it. And we are, uh, it is about our brands. And our brands are doing phenomenally well from an FM perspective and have been incredibly resilient. <laughs> Uh, against all the odds and sort of uh, supposedly wise commentators. Uh, they, they do phenomenally well, but apps and digital and other sort of distribution platforms have been an acceleration of those brands. And that's been another business model for us. So it's just building in into that sort of area. Um, and that, for, for us, it's, it's another area to explore rather than something that replaces it or we're, we're sort of overly worried about. But the, the, the power of the brand and the focus on the brand and where that goes is, is what we're doing and why we're doing it, we, we think, pretty successfully so far. Yeah. Just yeah. one pick up on the brand. I mean, we, we're it's fortunate we work with lots of brands, including Global and you know, Absolute and a whole bunch of other people. And, and the brand is important, but I think it's probably, you know, get a little controversial, it's probably most important for the media planner buyer because nobody ever got fired for buying what their boss used to buy when they had their job. So they just keep buying the same stuff against unempirical data that's the broadcast data. The consumer's already moved. They're moving to mobile. They will all move to mobile in the end. A large chunk of them will move to mobile, that's for sure. And at some point, marketing directors will demand that their agency buy on empirical data that's delivered through digital. Just buying on broadcasts off a survey of two or 3,000 people telling me I've got a reach of 12 million doesn't work in a digital environment killed newspapers, it's done it to TV, it will do it to radio. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Benjamin, uh, Trident is present in, in many different areas, uh, but you, you're both on one side pr providing the product, the advertising product to many publishers. On the other side, you're your sales team. You, you have a representation, you're representing inventory from publishers. Uh, so you, you're very well pleased actually to see what are the requirements from an agency, both in terms of sales, but also in terms of reporting? So what are the key elements that would differentiate radio agencies' requirements from digital agency requirements in terms of sales, criteria, measurement, reporting, and things like that? That's a broad question. Um, I would say that uh, from a more traditional perspective, they still try to trade on known currencies. So when we look in the States, what Panera did, was to take webcast metrics data, which looks like the Nielsen data or Arbitron data at that time, and be able to talk to the same buyers with the same language. When we talk to digital agencies, um, they don't even know most of the time what are the metrics coming from the broadcast world. So, world. so they're, they're sometimes requiring page views. At first, that was what was happening when we launched A2X. But now they understand that they have to have a mix mixed approach, um, and the fact that uh, even when you buy on, on webcast metrics data, because we can also on the impression, I mean on the delivery measure by impression, they also expect uh, post-campaign measurement and KPIs that look like any other type of digital buys. Um, so I think everything is evolving fast. Uh, you need to, uh, if you want to attract digital buyers, you won't be able to, to to do it just based on reach and frequency because they don't need to know how much is the CPM cost and how they will evaluate that and, and reach and frequency is too broad. It could be good for a general planning perspective, but once you need to execute it, they won't be executing buying a GRP. They, they have to actually traffic impressions in the system. So um, though in the States on our system, you can still buy and traffic spots or CPM impressions. So you need to be able to navigate in the two mix environment. Yeah. So, so Alexandre, to, to come back to the, the brand question, uh, obviously, Radionomy aggregates inventory from a 
thousands and thousands of publishers. So in markets like in the US where you have uh, very big brands like Pandora, Spotify, Deezer, iHack Media, et cetera, what kind of challenges are you facing when you try to package the inventory of all those small publishers and you're facing agencies that basically are used to buy very big brands? So in target, in target spot, we never sell brands. We, we are a network, so uh, we have a lot of radio stations. We work for CBS. We work for a lot of uh, important names in, uh, in the US. But uh, when we receive a campaign, they know who are the radio stations in the network, but they never can ask to be just on, on CBS, to be just on Radio Nomi, and to be just on Groove Shark, for example. So uh, today, when uh, we, we receive uh, an RFP from, uh, from an advertiser, they ask us more to have 50 million impressions on mobile with uh, bannering and things like that, than just to ask to have uh, a campaign on this station or another station. Yeah. Uh, on this, I can add that um, on A2X, when we launched a programmatic exchange two years ago, um, people were just buying into A2X because they knew it was brand safe. They knew the brand part of the exchange, but they weren't targeting specific brands. But uh, s not to say surprisingly, but in the past six months, we started to see a lot of agencies or publishers that wanted to execute programmatic direct deals. So they're telling us, I want that agency to buy my inventory and I, I want to have it programmatically executed. So we, it, w when we say that programmatic is not a channel, m more a mechanism, we really see it in, in, in reality because the, the money is just flowing uh, and they try to automate the flow of money because it saves money both on the agency and publisher side because it saves costs on ad operations. So we see that programmatic means different things on one side an exchange that pulls massive amount of brands where someone just target specific audience or they want to specifically target specific audience on a certain publishers or sometimes just buy all the impressions of that specific publisher but uh, automate the buy. Yeah. So, so staying on programmatic, which is always very interesting, and obviously everybody talks about programmatic, it's coming, it's rising, et cetera. The reality is it's, it's not very far yet. Uh, but one of, the, uh, one of the things we hear from publishers is that they're, they're very concerned that it could basically bring the prices down, that, that the CPM will go down. Uh, the agencies say the opposite. They say, no, it's going to increase the CPM. So, and it, and it, yeah, no, that's a false uh, perception. So, Which one? Uh, the fact that it drives the price down. Because uh, on display advertising, it did. But it did because it was a remnant play. It was a way to optimize unsold inventory. In the case of programmatic exchange uh, in TV or in, in radio, in, in audio with A2X, it's not there to optimize uh, remnant inventory. It's there to enable agencies to streamline ad operations. And, and um, uh, Steve from, from um, uh, on the previous panel set, uh, told us that it's also to enable the marketers to, to specifically target their audience. And that brings a value. That's what we bring on the table. So because of that, the agencies are paying a premium price. And when we looked uh, at the CPM flowing in the exchange, when it's a programmatic campaign that we target the, the marketer's um, inventory, it, it's at parity with the value of spots uh, in the terrestrial side. So it's high uh, double digit CPM. So it's not driving down the prices. So Stuart, I mean, in your experience, because obviously, I mean, UK market is, is just starting. So yeah. it might be, it's early days, but obviously you're discussing with agencies on both sides uh, both on the programmatic and direct. Yeah. What's your perspective on that? I, I think the truth is you have to have a, a sort of full offering, really, in this environment. And yeah. it's a uh, programmatic, again, just to support what uh, you're saying there, it is about facilitating the deal, if you like, and, and sort of programmatic does that. I think where it came from in display, it, it wasn't from a great place. It was, it was trying to sort of just flog off display. Yeah. So if you set the yield waterfalls out and you kind of work out what you're doing and how you're, uh, how you're set trading it. As like Rob said earlier as well, that this sort of content solutions market is, is phenomenally buoyant and growing um, literally week by week. Uh, so that's a, a sort of direct sell plus, if you like, where you're 
building out an entire solution with the inventory that you have. Um, and that commands a premium again, because you talk about integrations with editorial, et cetera. So there's a, a waterfall of, of pricing. And ultimately, the publishers uh, uh, control where that is. If you just open up for the free fall, it's only going to go one way. So, so despite what Steve or anyone says, agencies will try and buy it as cheap as possible. But that's fine. You know, and we're trying to get it as high as possible. But somewhere in the middle, as long as you have reasonable discussions around it, you'll get to a place where everyone feels vaguely violated, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but kind of with a smile on your face. And, it's, uh, 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 and that, that's the, I shouldn't, that's the wrong, isn't it? Any, every, on every level. But, but, but that's the point. And we'll find our price and we'll find our way of trading. And programmatic allows that to be had far quicker than, than previously. But you need your deals and you need a market that makes sense first. You need a market that makes sense to planners. You need a market that makes sense to clients. That way, you can actually establish what your role you play and the value you attribute to it. Yeah, you need to have enough supply to start with. Else, yeah, sure. else it's like if yeah. you have a family of four people and you wait for a table in a restaurant and the biggest table they have is for two people, mm. you will change restaurants. Yeah. So you need to have enough supply. Yeah. Once you have enough supply, you can drive value up. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the yield against the... The overall return on investment against the sell-through rate Mm -hmm. I think talks to what Stuart really spoken about there. And I see probably the, the direct sale market actually then supporting the programmatic at the top end. So you're still going to get you know, pretty decent CPMs. But if that job's been done correctly, then even run of site, you know, and hopefully as we get more volume, there is you know, total run of site then where you, where you are just you know, bucket shifting basically to get the highest sell through rate possible. And there probably will be three or four or five different scales of that throughout the whole you know, media roster that you have available. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alexandre, you, you had a come? Yes, it, it, it just depends on the, the, the size of the inventory because uh, today we have not enough inventory, so we have no pressure on the CPM. But uh, I think that in the future, when uh, the network will be bigger, I'm sure we will, we will have more pressure on the CPM. It, it can bring the CPM to, to less CPM. But it depends always also of the kind of inventory. If you work with really smart inventory, um, what is smart inventory? Inventory on mobile, inventory with bannering, uh, inventory with uh, specific targeting. I think that the CPN can be still and, and stay higher than normal or basic audio, audio ads. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the second thing that Pandora brought on the table is to bring registered audience in front mm -hmm. of the buyer. <laughs> so they know exactly the demo. I mean, exactly. The dem they, they have to trust the, the users, but at least they have demographic information and zip codes, so they know who to target. And when you, we contrast that to, to uh, a listener listening through iTunes, for example, where you lose cookies and device ID, yeah. and you don't have registration information, that will drive, drive down the value of CPM if you don't provide some enriched profiles That's to that audience. But I think the other key there as well, it's the banner and everything associated with that, gives you interactivity. It makes it a real digital buy. Mm -hmm as opposed to running in stream through DAB, that's just a radio in the corner. It's delivered in a different way, but it's just a radio in the corner. That's not digital advertising in any way, shape, or form. So you need the other types of media with that in order to give it value yeah. for the digital buyer especially, but I think more and more for the radio buyer as well. I'm so not sure we necessarily need the companion banner, provided we can track and measure the effectiveness of the campaign fire a data management platform that can be done with proper technology integration and does no longer require the banner, especially with the DAS that was launched uh, uh, last week by the IAB, so the Digital Audio mm -hmm. Ad Serving mm -hmm. Template, which is a, good, uh, a great milestone. So we can build on top of that to have a standard and open up the market. So how do you think that's going to help the market? Okay, it, it's a very good point. I mean, agencies have been saying for a long time that the lack of standards, in a way, was, was a blocker. How do you think that's because help? we don't need to ask to implement the Triton or the AdsWiz or Target Spot technology. We can just say you need to comply with DAST and it, it will flow like VAST and VPay did for video. You just talk about standards. So you, you don't need to sign an NDA, uh, try to do complex integration. You just follow the standard. But do you not think though as the, as the, if you like, the technology but also the buying matures? 
and people are, the agencies are looking for CPC across that as well. Unless you can you build in the interactivity, you know, to get last click wins all. Uh, you you, you can, think at some point they're going to move to that, you, and, and there will be certain campaigns where they're going to want absolutely on engagement and and not just. I don't know about the C about the A for the action or the measurement certainly, and it does bring what we need to track from a server side perspective what's happening. So they still may want to buy CPM, but be able to measure what's happening. I don't think we'll go to clicks because most of the, the campaigns are more branding if we compare to a lot of yeah. this. But do you not, do you not think that's because it's coming out of a radio, which is all branding up until this point, because there is no action. But as, that, as the digital sophistication increases, there will be a chunk of those campaigns that will be absolutely driven by action. Probably, yes, but I think that when I looked at campaigns that flew through A2X in the past two years, there's a lot of digital branding campaigns not coming from uh, radio budgets. So the, at least in the States, we see in a lot of programmatic advertising events that there's a lot of brand, programmatic branding thinking. So they try to figure out how to measure brand uh, awareness, not just clicks or last click type of KPI. So, so I think Stuart, the agency you, will you, get you had to come. I, I, I think this is part of the problem, though. <laughs> you've, got, you've got sort of um, uh, people focusing on cost per clicks and loads and loads of digital metrics. I think that's so limiting. Uh, I think the whole point is there is a mass opportunity to drive brand equity and drive brand metrics in digital audio. Yeah, the viewability issues alone. I mean, you've got with, with the tracking that we've done, um, actually with you guys, we know we've got about 95% listen-through rates on 30-second ads. That is a proper brand exposure that just doesn't really exist. And there's so much you can do, so much untapped sort of depth and wealth in audio that still is the biggest driver for us. You see, then you're talking about the brand of digital audio as a whole, not necessarily of a specific. I mean, it's like if the brand is for a consumer. To yeah. select the kind of content they're interested in, but towards the agencies, it's more the uh, the quality of the audience eh, and the ability to target that, them, I, the ability to report on them. Of, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, gosh, you go to any sort of digital conference right now. That sort of the idea is around the discussions around programmatic, even yeah. doing branding, uh, and what? Why not? But you just have to get it all aligned, and it's not about. Um, uh, sort of fast track and automated creative that is it's just going to consolidate around price uh, and offer and pro to that, that that's not branding that's that's immediate cost per click or cost per sale or cost per acquisition there's a big role for that in digital clearly and probably in this marketplace as well but it's not the only one yeah. and i think the the branding element to it all is the thing that drives big sort of movements in the, the valuation of companies uh, in, in the brand metrics, in price elasticities, the whole works. Yeah. And that's where we're kind of focusing a lot of our efforts on. So, Alexander, ju just to, on the programmatic side, and this is a tricky question, obviously. Um, so, as programmatic writers, and as Benjamin mentioned, programmatic is, is about automating the process. What's the role of the networks? So, uh, I would say it depends also always about the size of the, of the inventory. So uh, I'll think uh, we are in a digital market. A part of the audience will go to RTB, programmatic, but uh, during the next five years, it will be with salespeople, talking with agency. And uh, because uh, a, a lot of the audience will stay in, in traditional radio. So uh, uh, I think that the situation in five years can be, will be not the same, but uh, uh, programmatic, I don't know what are the real numbers, but uh, I think it's, it's still really Small. nothing in Europe and uh, one person of the market in, uh, in the US. So, so we talk more about, um, about the future and uh, the main goal for the next two or three years is to build a network. Yeah. And after, uh, I think programmatic solution can be, can be a, a really good thing. If the, if, if the network is bigger, if, if the, the audience is larger yeah. than today. We, we also operate a network in the States, so I think it's to package the impression with audience and make it uh, meaningful for the agency and buyer and help the buyer buy. Because even in the stock exchange, you can, you can log in and buy stocks, but most of the time you want to talk to some experts before you do any transactions. So networks or people representing inventory 
will always have a role. It may change because they will no, no longer get a, a paper I.O., but they still need to help people buy and package and make it meaningful because a buyer is not necessarily building the strategy. So you need to also talk to the strategists at the, at the brand or at the agency to make sure they understand how uh, and why they want to buy audio and make sure it's part of the plan. So this is the role that the network or or any anyone representing the inventory still will still have to do, yep. and the transaction the transaction will be automated, but they will be supported by some expertise. Yeah. It, it, so it, it depends also about who is the publisher. The situation is not the same if you are a pure play, if you are a local or regional station, or you are an important station in your country, because the technis, the technical solution that you need. <laughs> to be part of the network are, are, are different. It, it's why uh, in our company we have for pure play the radio and solution, we have the shoutcast solution for small and medium broadcaster and more professional solution with, uh, with target spot for more important publisher. So t talking about that and talking about content, I mean, Rob, you, with digital we're, we're starting to have a, a very wide offering of different kinds of content. I mean, we're, we're moving away from linear, we have some on-demand, I mean, you're more, almost more in the podcast and in the, uh, the actual content delivery is very different. Is that an obstacle when it comes to sales strategies? Are you able to package podcasts or, or on-demand content together with linear content? The, the major issue we have at the moment is, is really the length of creative that's produced right now. Um, you know, typically in the marketplace, it's 30, 40 second pre-rolls. Um, but when you look at the way audio is consumed digitally, in a poll environment, not in a like a tune-in push, it's a whole of a radio show. But people actually choosing what they want to listen to when they want to listen to it, maybe creating playlists out of that, maybe we're creating radio style packages from five or six different clips from you know different content providers in and around the same subject. Trying to run 40 seconds at the front of a minute 30 clip just doesn't work. But it, it's what the user is going for. I mean we you know many years at, uh, at YouTube and the way even video consumption is now down average YouTube uh, watching is now under 45 <laughs> seconds per video so the, the, the ads that they're now running are not applicable for what they're doing which is why everybody skips so trying to put a 40 second on the front of a 1 minute 30 piece of audio clearly not going to work so if we need 5 to 10 second pre-rolls to make that work that creative doesn't, doesn't exist so, you know, we put a team in place, and the guys at Global are, are doing creative themselves now to do that. So that's actually our biggest obstacle. The whole linear stuff, we don't do linear at all. So where we are totally on demand, for many of our partners, we are their version of iPlayer, or their, we're their catch-up service, or they're using our platform to push to Facebook and Twitter with the audio embedded to drive engagement back to the website for the longer form. So, so we have many other challenges around that, but for us, certainly, it's size of creative to begin with. But, but too, you mean that agencies are totally fine to buy a combination of on-demand and linear? So if, for example, they don't know if the ad's going to be downloaded or if it's going to be listened to on the spot, it's not an issue. Well, again, we, we, we don't do the download thing, because, again, approaching this very much from, from without any legacy. Yeah. You know, it's about streaming for us. It's all about on-demand. You know, a lot of our content partners, when we first went to them, were, you know, we, we already upload to iTunes. Why would we come and work with you guys? We've got 200,000 downloads a month on iTunes. It's great. 90-odd percent of all content downloaded on iTunes is deleted before it's listened to. Yeah. For me, that's, again, that's not digital. It's pointless. So we're all about on demand. So really, we, we don't touch that at yeah. all. Just, sorry, just building on that, I think, yeah. first of all, the scale is, is hugely important to that, that part of it all. And actually working with different partners on different creative executions is also where it's going it, it's, to... It's complicated, but it's not been explored properly. I mean, yeah. audio in its, in its own right is not explored properly. So we've got a... Uh, we, we went up to Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So, so why is that? Sorry? Why, why wasn't that... A, it wasn't uh, that explored properly? It doesn't properly. get creative a, creatives a, a yeah. salary rise. Um, and you know they, they want their big epic TV yeah. ads. That's what they want in their reel. I, I know a lot of creative directors, and it's it's the same. But it's not exactly they, they don't shy away from it. That that's the motivation. Yeah. Um, but I mean we we've now sort of beefed up our own creative offering. We have now 63 creatives in the UK, 
uh, to do audio because we need it. We, we can't have that block in our marketplace. Uh, and again, that, that's sort of rolling out. And part of our sort of DAX expansion, if you like, is we, we've got over 400 salespeople trading with local businesses. And we've currently on start the rollout of that. But having that bandwidth and the creative ability to link the two together and offer, if you like, a full service offering, that's, that, that's what we'll do. And that's yeah. what we'll do it. Yeah, we often you, talk about the mechanism, but not a, a, enough about the creative yeah. part. Spotify does a great job on the creative. It needs to be targeted to the user and relevant to the type of content. Or mm. if you listen to public radio in the States where it's underwriting, it's short and sweet. So I think a lot of creative agencies forget that on digital audio, most of the time people have headset connected. So you don't need to cut through noise. Mm. So you can get rid of the background music and heavy noise and just focus on the message. And if you make it, I keep telling that to my sales team in, in, in the States, we should sell seven second audio clip. Like it has to be short and effective, yeah. not 30 second things that you forget what it is about once you listen through the clip. And I think the, the, you guys obviously talk about creative in terms of the, the ad creative. I, I think it's probably even more fundamental than that and, and we'll be moving forward. It's about the actual creative of the audio that you're putting the advertising on. So the fact that it's native and, and connected it, it's to the content. But actually just up until now, all audio pretty much has been radio station audio. Yeah. Hour and two hour and three hour program, programs on digital, on mobile, people are consuming one to two to three minutes pieces of audio. When I was first asked to look at, at audio booth, you know, working over in SF, I'm like, mm, yeah, it's audio, it's not video, having worked in, in video for four and a half years. Then I looked at it and went, why doesn't audio go viral like video does? And that's because pretty much all audio on the web today is too long and it's too boring. Yeah. Who's gonna share an hour podcast on Twitter? Yeah. It's so, a minute, yeah. two minutes, three minutes. So yeah. different creative yeah. gives you different advertising options. So obviously our panel is, is pretty passionate about this, but uh, I'd love, we, we have a few minutes to go. I'd love to open it up to questions. Any question? Yeah, sure. Question. I don't question know if it's on. Is it? Hello, well, you'll hear me. Question to Alexander. Do you come up against the creative issue as much as sort of people are expressing here? Sorry. Do, do your, does your business and does Target Spot in the US, do they find that creative is an obstacle? Yeah, to, sure, to sure. Growth? Sure, we have this, in the same building a company and we work a lot with this company because uh, it depends if you work on pre-roll pre or in stream, but uh, um, I agree with you. Uh, during our statistic, after 12 seconds of pre-roll, we have a lot of people who decide to move to another station. So uh, the creative part is really important. And um, we can build also, because we target some specific listener, because uh, uh, it's not in the radio, but it's, it's on the listener side. And with some advertiser, we create some stories. So uh, we know that the first ad will be this one, the second one will be this one, and uh, the third one will be, will, will be another one. So uh, yes, the creative is a really important part. I will say that, uh, 5% of 10% of the campaign today works with, with different ads that you can find on uh, traditional radio. But I think if you want to be more and more efficient in the future, you have to think about that, sure. Other questions? Over there? <laughs> just shout again. Yeah. Strange at this point in time, just as maturity is coming into the industry, 
there seems to be a wide gulf. I'm not quite sure what that is, and it worries me. It seems to be that we're going down a let's recreate radar rather than a let's try and actually make the content relevant and then sell out the time. Yeah. So, so I think the, the reality is probably in between. I'm probably going to hand over to, to Benjamin in a second. But if you look at, I, I agree, CDNC, everything, it's on their servers, et cetera. But when you look at most of the solutions that exist out there, whether it's Triton, whether it's AdSuite, whether it's anyone is actually already doing measurement today, most of the time it's based on the logs of the servers. So it's exactly issued by the CDN. It's just that often the CDN himself is kind of, there is a conflict of interest. So usually it's a third party that's doing it but based on the logs of the CDN or based on software on the CDN. But yeah, Benjamin, that's, you that's, that's probably more a UK problem with how Rager is or not measuring the digital side because in the US, uh, Triton is a content delivery network and there's webcast metrics, which is MRC accredited. So it's officially accredited at arm's length from Triton that can measure exactly the throughput of every streams, including Panera, most pure plays, and most uh, radio broadcasters in the US. And then when we deliver the ad, there's a affidavit that will exactly show how many spots or impressions were delivered really precisely based on the server delivery. So there's no survey. It's the exact delivery, both on the measurement and on the delivery yeah. side. So there, there's no problem in the US. It's and that, even, that even in fixed. Europe, there's several yeah. markets where this kind of initiative is already going on. As a technology provider that partners with the CDNs to collect all the information and measure that, and, uh, and uh, in in the UK it's a, it's not as advanced as in other markets, but it's definitely a conversation that has been started with Radio. So, uh, totally agree with your point. I, I think the picture is not as as bad as it looks, but it should move faster. I think we we all agree on that. Okay, so thank you. Thanks. <laughs>